Hello, I'm Willie George. Welcome to this edition of the Faith Roots Podcast. And this series, we're talking about how Jesus had a children's ministry. And I'm taking you through the Gospel of Matthew to show you the seven different times where Christ talked about or ministered directly to children. And so here we're going to show you Matthew's Gospel, chapter 17, verses 14, 15, and 16. Uh, It says, When they had come to the multitude, a man came to him, kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is moonstruck, lunatic, but moonstruck is literally what it meant. He has bad fits, for he will often throw himself into the fire and often into the water. So I brought him to your disciples, but they couldn't cure him. Now, what I want you to see is that Jesus had already given his disciples, authority and power over demonic spirits. Here's Matthew chapter 10, seven chapters earlier, verse 1. When he had called his 12 disciples to him, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. So these guys had that authority. They just weren't capable of using it right then. I'll show you why in a minute. Uh, but uh, they weren't powerless. Uh, in fact, there are times when uh, some of the Bibles will put mighty Christ, uh, powerless disciples. Uh, they weren't powerless. They had the power. They just weren't using it. And so there's also another irony here, and it's this, because in the previous episode we read about in the the book of Matthew chapter 15, there was a woman who came to Jesus And she had a demon-possessed daughter. She was a Canaanite. She was outside the covenant. And Jesus didn't show any interest in helping her at all. He refused to answer. And he he didn't answer her a word. And so this guy comes along. And in one of the, the narratives, it says that he said to the Lord, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. So he wasn't a man strong and full of faith. In fact, Jesus said about this Canaanite woman that she had great faith. Here's this Jewish man that doesn't have great faith. He says he it says in himself he, he has weak faith, but Jesus instantly responds to him. So why? It's because he is in the covenant. He is a part of the covenant family, and that's who Jesus had a commission to go help. So that's the irony. Now, Jesus had displeasure. He showed displeasure here. Because the disciples could have done something about this. When uh, the man said, I brought him to your disciples, they couldn't cure him. Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and misguided generation, how long can I put up with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him, and the child was cured instantly. Now let me tell you why Christ was a little bit put off by this and why he was not pleased with his disciples. And let me give you just a little background. This is Matthew's Gospel, chapter 17. It follows on the heels of Matthew 16. In Matthew 16, Jesus on purpose took his disciples to the extreme northern part of Israel into the area around Caesarea Philippi. The place that he took them was known figuratively as the gates of hell. It was a spring and a pond where people did all kinds of horrible things to worship devils. Today it is known as Banyas. It is named after the Greek god of wine, Pan, but the Arabs couldn't pronounce the P, so they called it Banyas instead of Panyas. And so uh, this was called the gates of hell. It was a demonic place of worship. And so this had an evil feel to it. It was here that Jesus asked the disciples, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they answered, Some say you're Elijah or Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Some say you're John the Baptist. He said, well, who do you say that I am? And Peter spoke up and said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, Simon, son of Jonas, flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto you that you are little rock. You are little rock is what he said to him. You're Petros, you're little rock. But upon this Petra, this big rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell 
will not prevail against it. They were at the place known as the gates of hell. And Jesus said that the gates of hell would be the place in defense. They're the ones with the city and the gates. It's not that we're holed up in a city and we're under attack from all of the demonic powers. We don't need to think that way. We're the ones with authority and power. We have authority over the gates of hell. And Jesus said, you get this authority when you're on the Petra, when you're on the rock. What is the rock? Flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. In other words, revelation knowledge is the rock on which Christ builds his church. And so Jesus has said that if you have revelation knowledge, there is no demon, no devil, nothing from hell, nothing that's going to hell can stop you. You have power and authority over it. Now, immediately after this, in the early part of Matthew 17, Jesus takes three, Peter, James, John, and they climb this tall mountain. Scripture doesn't say exactly where it is, but it's very nearby where he just was. It would seem to refer to Mount Hermon, and I think it was for this reason. Mount Hermon, according to the book of Enoch, was where the fallen angels of Genesis 6-1 came down into man who left their first habitation, they left their form, they changed their form, and came to corrupt the human race. That is found in Genesis chapter 6. And the the, uh, uh, tradition states and the book of Enoch states that they came down, first of all, on Mount Hermon. Jesus goes to the top of this mountain, whether it's Hermon or another one. And on this mountaintop, he is glorified, and Moses and Elijah appear and converse with him, and Peter, James, and John see him in all of his glory. Now, this is important. I believe that it was important for him to receive this glory and be recognized as the victor even before he goes to the cross. He's recognized as the victor in power because of where he is and because he's very near to the place called the gates of hell. He didn't just go to these places accidentally. He chose them carefully, purposely. He took his disciples there on purpose to teach them a particular thing. Now, when he comes off the mountain, there is a boy who is demon-possessed, and the apostles are a little bit fooled by this because they have cast demons out of people before, and now they don't seem to be able to. It is because some demons have a little more authority than others do. They're not all of the same stripe. And for this reason, Jesus had said, this kind goes not out but by prayer and fasting. They asked the question, why couldn't we cast him out? So there are times when you resist the devil and he turns around and leaves instantly. There are other times when you stand your ground in a time of temptation, but the devil doesn't leave very quickly. And he continues to assault you and come after you, and he doesn't leave right away. What do you do? You continue to stand. That's what Ephesians chapter 6 says, having done all to stand, stand therefore. You keep standing because the word will work. There's a story in the Old Testament about one of David's mighty men who fought so hard all day long that his hand was frozen to the sword. And there are times when your battle spiritually will be your hand is frozen to the sword because you have stood your ground, you have spoken the word, you've stayed strong, you've never let go of it, you've continued to speak. And your hand has frozen to the sword. That's what Jesus was teaching. And so when this this man comes with this demon-possessed son, it really is an affront to Jesus. It's not the father and the son that are giving him an affront. It's the devil saying, you think you have great power. You don't have power over this. Immediately Jesus speaks and this demon is gone. Uh, But he's demonstrating, I have authority over you. And it's the devil trying to challenge him and make him think, Yeah, the word worked before, but it won't work all the time. But it does work all the time. So that gives you a little bit of background about this story. So it helps you. So 
He was telling them, and, and listen to what he says. He said, I say to you that if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say to this mountain, remove to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Howbeit there is no way of casting out such spirits as this except by prayer and fasting. So he's saying faith works like a seed. You put the seed in the ground, the seed works. Even if it's a little seed, it still works. In other words, the Word of God and the Scriptures work. You act on them, you put them in the ground, they will do their job. He also goes on to say, fasting will help you to focus. Fasting doesn't build faith. Fasting is a way to focus on the faith you already have. And so he's saying there are some times when you get into battles where you may find the need to fast so that you can stay focused on your fight and become even more convinced of what it is you believe. Focus is the aim of fasting. Well... This is such an important lesson, and I hope you've gotten something out of it. But it's another interesting story of how Jesus encountered children and how he demonstrated that God wants to bless kids when Satan oppresses them. See you tomorrow. I want to thank you for watching our podcast today. And if you really liked it, would you please give us a little thumbs up by clicking on that sign down below. And then I would encourage you to subscribe to our channel so you don't miss any of our future podcasts because they're all going to be good. And if you would like to support us financially, either with a one-time gift or recurring gift, you can do that by clicking on the link below or going to myfaithroots.com. Thank you so much for watching this program.